am Jessica. I'm the program manager for Greensboro Bound, and I'm super pleased and honored to have with us today Sister Helen Krajean and Tessie Castillo. Uh, Tessie is the co-author of Crimson Letters, which I'll hold up here. There we go. Um, Voices from Death Row. And then Sister Helen's uh, autobiography here, River of Fire. Um, I highly recommend both of these. Uh, they're very different reads if you haven't read them, but they are excellent. Uh, and give a shout out to Scuppernong Books if you're local. Um, so just a reminder, as we move through today, uh, when we'll get to a portion of the, of the conversation where you, our audience, can ask, um, you can ask questions. However, we're gonna want you to chat those. And so if you open your chat box, if you would send those directly to me, so I should be listed under Greensboro Bound. Um, if you'll send those directly to me so that I can see them and then ask them of our guests. We will also be joined uh, in a few minutes by Lyle May. He is one of Tessie's co-authors. He'll be calling in uh, to join us for a portion of the conversation. So uh, I'm actually just gonna go ahead and be quiet and turn it over to, um, to Sister Helen and Tessie. Um, so if you ladies will just jump in and tell us, um, you know, what a little bit about yourselves, if there's anything else you'd like to say, um, and then kind of dig into why we're all here today uh, to have this, this conversation. So go ahead, I'll start with you, Sister Helen. Okay, I'm delighted to be part of this. Uh, I believe that writing experiences and telling stories can change the world. And that's what I see in, in the Crimson Letters really good writing. And as a writer, you can't help but rejoice in that. I never dreamed I was going to write a book, Dead Man Walking, much less two others. Uh, but you get thrown into experiences and you learn things. And there's a, there was just a desire in me to share, to take people there. So when I was part and witnessed the first execution of a human being in Louisiana in 1984, it was a Patrick Sonier and it was by electrocution. Uh, I witnessed his killing, came out of that execution chamber, it was the middle of the night. At that time in the United States, uh, I think 90% of people were all in support of the death penalty. The public had been made to be afraid, thought it was a good idea, look at the terrible crime in cold blood. Pat and his brother killed two teenage kids, they deserved to die, the state did it. And I came out and the first thing I did was throw up. Uh, I've been brought close and I watched what it meant to take a human being, forget all the humanness in him or how he had developed and all that he was other than that murder, and you strap him down and you kill him. And it's legal and often religion's brought in to justify it. But I knew what my eyes had seen. As a saying from Latin America, what the eye does not see, the heart cannot feel. But by the end, so then that night in the dark, throwing up in the parking lot outside Angola prison, I remember thinking the American people are good people. If, we, if I can bring them close to what I've just witnessed, they are going to change about the death penalty. It's going to be a journey. It's going to be a lot of the ambivalence that we feel. But, and it was kind of like Elliot Vazell with the Holocaust. When you have witnessed something, it's a moral imperative to share what you have witnessed. And so reading Lyle, Lyle May, that unfolding of his soul and his life, that's worth sharing with people. As Tolstoy said, nobody wants to read stories of happy families. You want to read about human beings that have real conflict and who change. So I'm delighted to be a part of this conversation. Thank you, Tessie, for getting in there and being part of it and then for these great human beings you've met and allowing their voices now to go out to the world. Thank you. I'm also really honored to be here and never thought that I would be speaking at an event with uh, Sister Helen, who I've been a fan of for many years. Uh, so thank you to her and to Greensboro Bound for hosting this event. Um, like Sister Helen said, I also got involved in death row completely by accident. I never thought I would be in this position either. Um, actually, my entry to death row was via a Super Bowl party. Um, I was just hanging out uh, near the food at a Super Bowl party a few years ago, and this guy wandered over. We started talking, 
And turns out he was a prison psychologist who worked specifically with men on death row inside mm -hmm. of prison. And in the course of our conversation, he let me know that for the very first time in the history of death row on North Carolina, the prison had opened up to allow volunteers inside to teach different classes like art and restorative justice to the men. Uh, so I decided to sign up to teach a writing class. And I remember my first day there, I was really scared. I had a lot of misperceptions about people on death row as, as many others do. Uh, and during the course of teaching that class, I was just completely floored at the level of um, redemption and humanity and compassion within the men that I was teaching. I, I just, every single one of them had completely different perspective on the world. And I just felt that those perspectives were so, were so valuable to me and to my growth. So I eventually wrote a letter to the local newspaper, the News Observer, where I basically advocated for the humanity of people on death row. I said, they're not the monsters that the public imagines them to be. And for that, I was dismissed as, uh, as a volunteer and my class was canceled. Uh, so I started writing to my former students and again, compiled this incredible stack of letters just bursting with insights uh, on a number of different issues and, and with remorse and, and with all of these really powerful things. And so I decided to propose writing a book to uh, four of the people who had been on death row who'd been in my class. And that is how Crimson Letters came about. And that's why I'm here, just to share those stories and, and provide a platform for them. All right, so Sister Helen, I want to come back to you just for a second. Um, so I have read uh, River of Fire, and so I know that's leading up to how basically your journey into advocating for the abolishment of the death penalty. Um, can you give us just a brief kind of where this book, you know, stops, Dead Man Walking picks up, and I, know, I understand that you were, um, it was, you were asked to write letters to the, to the gentleman. How did that actually come about? Um, to you begin that correspondence with him. Yeah, well, River of Fire is like the prequel to Dead Man Walking. It's right. about waking up I had to do, and I was like in a double cocoon. First of all, through white privilege and out in the suburbs and good Catholic nun, right, and teaching out in the suburbs in a Catholic parish. Um, but it was two things. It was also the spirituality where I felt if I just prayed that God was the one that handled the big problems of the world. And so I would pray for all the homeless people, for all the problems, but I didn't, I said, I'm apolitical. I ain't getting involved in political stuff. I'm a nun. I had to wake up out of that to the real radical message of Jesus, which is to be there, as Pope Francis says all the time, as a field hospital out where the wounded people. I was, I was so separated. In my own city in New Orleans, we had 10 major housing projects. So the first waking was to get out of the suburbs, go into the St. Thomas Housing Projects, and African-American people became my teachers. And look at us right now on the cusp of this huge epic change where white people are for the first time really joining African-Americans in the abuse that has been experienced 400 plus years. Where have the white people been? We haven't felt it. We haven't seen it. So there's huge wakening. And that's what happened to me. Black people became my teachers. I'm then in their neighborhood and I get an invitation to write a man on death row. I never dreamed he'd be killed, much less that I'd be there and the journey then began. So River of Fire is all about waking up. And I love what Lyle says. He says, I love about being educated and then sharing it with others. Educare, when we wake up to stuff, how the world works, where am I in it? What's my role in it? When we wake up about stuff and then we share it with other people, I just think that's a glorious thing to do. And I don't know a better way to do that than writing. Absolutely. So Tessie, let's come back to you. So you started this project and, and uh, began to see kind of what these men had to say and, and the quality of what they had to say. Um, so from there, how did everything come about? Uh, you know, tell us about the book, and kind of your, your vision for getting that message, sharing these stories. 
Sure. So it took about four years to write the book. It was really hard because uh, we're dealing with a prison system. They have no access to email. At the time, they had no access to phones. Uh, we started this book in 2015, I believe. And at that time, death row prisoners were only allowed one 10 minute phone call per year, usually oh. around Christmas time. That was it. Uh, so they had almost no contact with the outside world. So all of the writing of the book took place by snail mail. Just they would send me essays and I would look them over, provided very minimal uh, edits. The writing that you see in the book, that's, the, that's their writing. They are brilliant writers, every single one of them. And I don't take credit for anything that's, that they wrote in there. Um, and so I would provide minimal, minimal edits and then send it back and they would have to rewrite all their essays by hand and then send them back to me again. And I would provide comments again and send them back and they would have to rewrite them by hand again. And it was that year, that way back and forth for about four years until we compiled the entire book together. Uh, and what I hope to accomplish with this book is that I realize that most people like me prior to getting involved on death row have no idea who's there. You know, we have a state that is literally killing in our name and we don't know who they're doing it to. And I think that regardless of where you stand on the death penalty, it's really important to know to know who they are and to not allow um, silencing and little uh, labels like, oh, they're just monsters. We don't really need to know who they are. But you shouldn't allow that to color the fact that they're still human beings. And so I want this book to show who's there. Where did they come from? How did they get there? How might they have changed in the years since their conviction? And I think if we could really understand uh, the, the humanness inside of them, then we would, it would lead to better, ultimately better policy. All right. So Sister Helen, um, for you, what are some criminal justice reform issues uh, that you've been involved in advocating for? I guess the most obvious one would be for the abolishment of the death penalty. Um, right. So you can delve in a little deeper to, you know, concrete ways that you're working towards that, plus the other things that no doubt um, you're involved in as well. Right. So my main work has been what I described earlier from what I witnessed to what it means to give the state the power legally to kill a human being. And that's been the core of the dialogue with the public at large, also with the Catholic Church. Because in my letter to Pope John Paul II, which is in my second book, The Death of Innocence, about two innocent people that I was with, Joseph Odell, a man in Virginia, it, it hit Italy, found out about him in the Italian parliament I got. And so my direct question to the Pope was because the Catholic Church, Christian churches, and you can understand the history of this. Before you had prisons and a way to keep society safe for violent people, you gave the state, the government, the right to take life to save, to protect society. But then as you get prisons, so, and so when I was writing to the Pope, I just said, I keep noticing that in the statements bishops are making, and it wasn't just Catholics, it was Christians, this right of the state to take life. Amnesty International showed early on, you can never give government that kind of absolute power to, that we're gonna be able to decide a system of who deserves to die, the worst of the worst, that what we have to do is kill them, they can't be redeemed, that is impossible to do. And inevitably, you're gonna have bias, you're gonna go against poor people and so forth. And I said to the Pope, when I'm walking with a man to execution and he, shackled hand and foot he's surrounded by six guards he's going to walk like maybe 40 yards through a, a door and be strapped down into a chair and kill and he turns to me behind him and kind of whispers sister please pray that god holds up my legs when i make this walk and i said to the pope and it's no different to talk to a pope or to talk to anybody we talk to each other as human beings. We speak the truth we see. And I just said to him, does the Catholic Church only uphold the dignity of innocent life? What if a person is guilty of a crime? Where is the dignity in rendering him defenseless and then 
deliberately taking his life. And that began a conversation and that was bubbling up from all over. I'm not the lone person. We never do these things alone. We're always part of a community of consciousness that's rising. And in the Catholic Church, Pope John Paul became significant for the first time of publicly stating, even those among us who've done a terrible crime have a dignity that must not be taken from them and we need to abolish the death penalty. So in my journey, and it's all about waking people up. It's all about, and if I hadn't had a really good editor, Jason Epstein, when I wrote Dead Man Walking, you never would have heard of this book. There wouldn't have been a movie, there wouldn't have been an opera, there would have been nothing. Because in the beginning, I was so in the human rights of the one who had done the murder. And Jason Epstein, wonderful editor at Random House, looked at it and he said, you wait far too long before you talk about the horror of the crime, this man being executed, killed in cold blood, two innocent teenage kids. And if you don't, if that's not in the first 10 pages of your book, where you stand in horror at the crime, and then gradually take your reader over into the humanness of what it means now for the state to kill. Nobody's going to read your book. Besides, you're a nun. They're going to think, yeah, she believes in Jesus. She believes in forgiveness. They're going to expect every spiritual platitude. So he helped me shape that story. And the way we shape story is so important. You know, most people feel ambivalent about the death penalty. They think, well, if somebody killed my mother, if somebody killed my child, I know I'd want to see him dead. And and we have a journey to make on that. What well, That may be a big a thing we feel. It's a moral issue. But how can we possibly entrust over to government that they're going to be the deciders of who needs to live and die? So first, oh no, always that we got to draw a line in the sun and we can't let the government kill. And right behind that is we got to stop sentencing people to death in prison with life without parole sentence, that, which means that you can never be redeemed, you can never change. And I'll just end with this, with this little sorty so other people can get in here. But one time the warden at Angola prison, Louisiana, tough prison, said to me, sister, you know who by and large, what crime they're in here for that make our best trustees at this prison? I didn't know. And he said, those that committed murder. They were either on drugs or whatever. They didn't know when they got up on a certain morning, they were going to kill somebody. It's not a premeditated thing. Put them in a a prison, and especially if you have things like writing programs, education programs, people change. And he said, they make our best trustees. So my whole thing is you can't give government that absolute power over life and death, and much less to think that we're going to have the wisdom and we're going to be able to do it right. And we know we're not doing it right. There are over 168 wrongfully convicted people now. But even of those who are guilty, Look at the change. And that's what Lyle's story really shows. Look how this man, against tremendous odds, changed. And it throws you back on yourself. I mean, it throws me back on myself. I'm reading Lyle's story going, man, I had the most privileged childhood. I was loved. I had a great education. And he didn't have any of those things. And look what he did. And I think people like that that are transformed despite all these obstacles are our real heroes. People like me, well, I better be good. I better do something decent. Look what I was given. So I'm going to go ahead and invite our audience. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and start typing in some questions, we'll have a, just a few minutes here. I'm going to ask one more question um, for both uh, Sister Helen and for Tessie. Uh, but again, if you want to have questions, please make sure that in the chat box you are asking uh, directly to Greensboro Bound. That way I will see them and they can ask. Um, and then in about 10 minutes or so, uh, Tessie's gonna, gonna patch Lyle in and we'll be able to talk to him directly. Um, so Sister Helen, I think, uh, and Tessie, all with your comments are definitely um, hitting on a lot of just, it's important to share stories and we build empathy at, through communicating and sharing these life experiences of, of just being human um, and how that is all, you know, just that, that ties us together. Um, so just to, to dig in a little deeper to that, um, and whoever uh, wants to take this one first, um, why is it so important to advocate for people on death row specifically? Because I think they are people who are, are sentenced to death 
you know, we feel like, well, we wash our hands, we did our job, we throw them away. Um, why is it so important to, to not, to not do that? And whoever wants to, um, to take that question first, and then I'll go ahead and we're starting to get some questions in here. So go ahead. Go Tessie. Okay. Um, so I think there's a couple things here. One is that a lot of people, and I was like this too, have this idea that the people on death row are the worst of the worst criminals, that they've committed the worst of the worst crimes, that they're sort of this uh, elite group of murderers who are somehow worse even than the other people who may have committed murder. Uh, and the, probably the thing I learned about death row and the death penalty in general, even as I've researched the system, that shocked me the most was that that's not true. That there are people on death row who've been convicted of, of pretty terrible murders. There are also people who have been convicted of equal or worse murders who didn't get the death penalty. And there are people on death row who never killed anyone at all. Uh, so I think that more than having a, a worse genre of crimes, you see people on death row who have much more of a tendency to be from very poor backgrounds, to be minorities, um, many of them are illiterate, have mental health problems. They're, in short, the people who are the easiest to vilify and the easiest to convict. And that's how you've got on death, you, how you uh, can see the people on death row. And one of my favorite quotes uh, is by Dostoevsky, and it's about how you can judge the degree of civilization in a society by looking at their prisons. And I think that's so true. You know, if you take a person and you, you judge their character by how they treat their friends or how they treat their superiors, that doesn't really tell you a lot about them. What will tell you a lot is how they treat people who work for them, how they treat the homeless people that they walk by in the street, how they treat people who they might think are less than them. And that is when their character will really shine. And as a society, the fact that we take the least of ours and treat them in, in the degrading way that we do when we put people on death row and deny them the right to change even. Just say, you, you can't change. We're going to kill you. You can't change. Uh, I think that reflects a lot on, uh, on us as a society and, and doesn't allow our true goodness and humanity to shine through as long as we have a system that, that does that. All right. Sister Helen, I'm going to go ahead. I have a, a couple of questions for you. Um, so let's see. Um, a couple of people have questions specifically uh, pertaining to um, dead man walking and the writing of that. And so I'm going to try to paraphrase here. Um, so the first, the first part was um, what was the most difficult part of writing that book for you? And at the time, was the prison supportive of you writing that book or did you get like Tessie in her situation she got kicked out basically after talking about it um what was your experience there writing that book um and was there what was the pushback I'm sure there was some <laughs> the prison didn't have any earthly idea that the nun was writing a book oh, okay <laughs> I'm not in a situation like Tessie where I'm going in to teach. I'm going into a company at death row inmate and do everything I could. This had some conversations with the warden to when I got stepped outside that prison. I always abided by the rules in the prison, but when I stepped outside, it was I was going to work to bring an end to the death penalty. They knew I was doing that. So the writing of the book, the prison had nothing to do with Oh, are you writing a book, whatever? So it's a different situation from Tessie, who, because she wrote one editorial, was seen to be an advocate of political advocacy, and so she's removed from the prison. And I'm going to tell you right away, the, and the goodness, again, of this editor, Jason, the hardest thing about writing Dead May Walking was acknowledging mistakes, of being truthful about the mistakes. And I'm going to tell you my biggest one. And it was, so first of all, I'm waking up to human rights I'm with Amnesty International, ACLU, I'm learning about the criminal system, I'm in, accompanying a person on death row. Um, I didn't know what to do about the victim's families. Two young kids had been killed, and at least one of the parents was on the news saying, I can't wait to see this guy executed. And so I was scared, I, I, I didn't know what to do, like, I can't picture myself going and visiting them. And then they're gonna, what if they ask me the question? Hey, sister, 
don't you believe justice ought to be done? Look what happened. My 17-year-old son, my 18-year-old daughter found dead in that sugar cane field, shot in the back of the head. Don't you feel that justice demands this guy be executed? Can you stand with us? And I didn't know what I was going to say to them. I knew I didn't believe in the death penalty, but I thought better to stay away. So I did nothing. I didn't write them a note to tell them, I'm sorry about your son or your daughter. I didn't go to visit him. I didn't do anything. And I met them at the worst possible time because it was at the pardon board hearing one week before Pat was executed. And they were all there with their friends and relatives for one purpose, to ask the pardon board not to let this guy escape execution. And that's when I met them. And they couldn't have been more polarized. And we were walking outside while the pardon board was voting. And I ran right into the two sets of parents, Loretta Bork's mother and father. She had been killed, David LeBlanc, his mother and father. And the Borks were furious at me. Can't blame them. I'd done it all wrong. They walk right by me in silence. And right behind them comes Lloyd DeBlanc's son, David, and his wife. And he walked right up to me. And he said, Sister Helen, all this time, you've been visiting with those two brothers that killed our boy. And you didn't want to come to see us. I pray in this little chapel, come pray with me. And now he was the gracious one who issued the invitation. And so I went. And through him, he's really the hero of Dead Man Walking. I'm the storyteller. But when I was writing Dead Man Walking, I downplayed that I didn't go to visit the, the victims at all. And Jason Epstein, looking at the first you know, draft of the manuscript, said, you know, you really downplay not reaching out to the victim's family. That was a terrible mistake. And he looks right at me and he goes, it was cowardice, wasn't it? I mean, you were scared, weren't you? I go, oh, yeah. He said, look, when you write your book, don't just take people with you on the peaks of the waves where you did it right. Take them in the troughs where you made a mistake because then you'll be credible. And when you read like Lyle's story, I mean, he is so honest about every single thing he ever did wrong. He's... His, the transparency of his honesty draws you to him as a human being. And I had to learn that. And I had to have a good editor. So definitely that was one of the most difficult things that I had to. And so you grow when you're writing. You, it's a process of honesty. You grow in and then and to be able to reach out to your readers to take them with you in an honest way. All right, so another question for Sister Helen, um, and I just wanna let our audience know, some of you are asking specifically about um, um, starting, being able to start to write to prisoners on death row and things like that. Um, I see your questions and we will get to that. Um, I think that may be more appropriate after we actually hear from Lyle um, a little bit. And I think Tessie's in the process of connecting with him now. Um, so Sister Helen, I just wanna ask you in a generalized way, um, your your vows as a nun how is that you know tied into all of this um i'm trying to find the specific um the specific question here but basically knowing kind of where the catholic church was um and where they have come from and and where you are but you know how did that affect um you taking this issue on knowing that there was not initially great support within your own community um, and how your, you know, your personal beliefs uh, have transformed and, and moved on from that. All right. First, it wasn't great support with them. Remember, I'm in Louisiana, deeply Southern community. Our own sisters had to work through this issue. But with relationship with the Catholic Church, one of the things that had happened in the Catholic Church was what was called the Second Vatican Council. It was the first worldwide global council of the Catholic Church, not to condemn heresy in other people, thinking we'd one true church and all that. It was to relate to the world and it called us to look at the signs of the time and get involved and nuns especially responded to that. And so we had been freed up as a community to listen to the spirit within you, look at the needs of the time and through with the community always, but to start reaching out into new fields. And that's how I, I moved into St. Thomas Housing Projects 
and then from there moved to death row. And it all unfurled like a rose. It all is very integral. When, once you immerse yourself in situations where people are suffering and poor and there's injustice, you grow in it. My community has grown with me. So the Catholic Church per se, the hierarchy, uh, is one of the last to come on board, to come, I mean, because they're often, they're not that directly involved with poor people. I said that to Pope John Paul in that letter. I just said the more our hierarchy, our bishops are involved with poor people, the quicker they get it about the death penalty. But, but what you do is, just like we work for change in this country, you go to the people. And Vatican II had redefined the people. It's not the clergy, it's not the hierarchy, it's the people. So my mission brought me directly to the American people, the people in my church. It's when the consciousness of the people change that you get social change. And so that's what I was doing. So relationship, you got to understand about nuns and religious orders. There's a certain freedom we have as women that we can devote ourselves to the mission that we see as important. And you got the community support under you. So my vows are vows that I share everything that I own with the community and they in turn support me. Celibacy means I have the freedom. I don't have a husband. I don't have children. I don't have family. I'm a free agent to get in there with death row inmates, give myself over to them. And then obedience, it used to be obedience was your nun, your pious good nun, you just simply obey your superior, you don't think, and then you start using your mind, you get in there, you do critical social inquiry and critique, and you get in there and you get involved. So it's a special dynamic that's in sisterhood and in religious orders that's different from the setup in diocese between a bishop, the priest, uh, and those under the bishop. We have relationship, of course, with the bishops. It's not like we go do this on our own, but it does give you a special freedom as women to be able to get educated on stuff and to act. And uh, Viva La Sisterhood, it's been a tremendous support to me. All right, thank you. Okay, I think uh, Lyle is here with us. Lyle, are you there? Yep, hello. Hey Lyle, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Jessica. We have Sister Helen Prajean here and obviously you and Tessie are well acquainted. Um, thank you so much for joining us. So if you would just tell us a little bit about your background um, and uh, how you've become such a strong advocate for reform despite having been incarcerated um, since a pretty young age of 19. Um, so yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, my name is Lyle May. I, I've been incarcerated since 1997 at the age of 19. I have uh, essentially grown up on death row. Um, and my advocacy largely comes from learning from my friends who have been uh, put to death, uh, learning from important people in my life, friends, uh, certainly uh, priests who have been kind enough to uh, administered to us on, on Thursday Catholic Mass, uh, but also through the opportunity of higher education uh, since I've been incarcerated. Uh, I have managed to complete a Associates in Arts degree in the Social Science Emphasis through Ohio University in, in 2013. And when I reached that point and was given a, you know, given my <laughs> photocopied uh, degree, it, I was like, well, what, what do I do now? What does this even mean? Uh, and it took a couple of years for it to really sink in, you know, that while I had learned all these things in various courses, I kind of had a responsibility to do something with it. And I kind of found the avenue of writing. Uh, and it was in 2015 that I met Brian Stevenson, uh, and he gave a talk here on death row. You know, it was kind of amazing that he was even allowed in here, but uh, listening to him discuss um, making the community proximate with the people that incarcerates really struck something in me uh, enough so that I, I felt like, well, that's, that's something I could do, you know, with my writing. Uh, it didn't happen immediately. Uh, it took some time to uh, reach a point where 
that my writing was at least good enough to be published in journals. But with, with every publication, I felt a stronger sense of, of obligation to help the community understand that people in on death row and in prison in general are, are human beings, uh, human beings that they are in fact responsible for in many ways. Thank you. Um, so the next kind of moving on from that is how did you get involved with writing Crimson Letters? And then let's just start with that. How did you get involved? So Crimson Letters started uh, from Tessie's journaling class. Uh, this is kind of an extension of a number of programs that uh, then psychological uh, programs manager Peter Coon, Dr. Peter Coons initiated uh, around 2014-2015 and uh, the journaling class was one of them. Uh, I signed up uh, hoping to hone my writing and find ways to kind of dig deeper into uh, the emotional content of my experiences and that's kind of how I, I met Tessie. Crimson Letters developed uh, kind of after she was kicked out of the, the prison and uh, uh, fired from her volunteer job. And it was this, uh, essentially this offer to, you know, continue writing, uh, but writing for a purpose, uh, a goal of combining our collective experiences into this this book that people could potentially learn from. And I, I saw this as yet another way to, you know, bridge the gap between us and the community. So Lyle, I've read, um, I've read all of the, I've read Crimson Letters and all of the stories um, and there are the essays. I don't want to call them stories because they're, they're, they're very personal. Um, and they, all four of you kind of, you have different voices and you have different things that you're, that you're saying. Um, so collectively, and you can speak either as the, the four, the whole book collectively, and then just um, from your own portion, um, what is the main message um, of, this, of this book? We are human beings. People who are on death row who have been essentially thrown away by society, we are human beings who, many of whom have made mistakes, some of whom are, are actually quite innocent. Uh, but all of whom are, are human beings that are so far beyond who they used to be. Prison is a place, it is a, an experience, it is a period of time in which people continue to grow, to develop, to age, to die. Uh, it is a very different place than any other, certainly, but it is still just a place where people continue to be people. Um, the stories in Crimson Letters, uh, a lot of them are, you know, from the past. They kind of help describe our influences, certainly. Uh, and then some of them are, are very much uh, about the present. Uh, but they, they nonetheless are about learning, about finding out what it means to be human. Uh, it is about our experiences with executions, it, uh, you know, a lot of them were very difficult to write, uh, certainly. Uh, I think for me, the, the most difficult one was learning to die uh, and really expressing just the, the, the unfathomable pain of losing somebody to an execution. Uh, of realizing that that is the very fate that is intended for me, but also learning that even if that is my fate, I still have a life to live, though it's on death row. And that's a lot of where my advocacy comes from because I, I just cannot imagine giving up while I still have life in my body. And, and that is a, a large reason why I write the way I do. Yeah, that that essay, just on a personal note, was one that touched me because I think that people, um, we take for granted that you get to know the men that are there with you as human beings and then on some arbitrary date, you know that they will die 
and you've witnessed that over and over and over again and the repeated trauma of that I think might be uh, not even might that is more than any of us would ever bear um, to have to see people that we've gotten to know and trust and have learned from um, be executed you know at some point and they have absolutely no control over that um, and so I personally thank you for sharing that that essay that was one that definitely struck me um, so uh, just to take a breath from that uh, I want to move on to the next question which I'll ask of each of you um, so Lyle just a little background I um, I don't know uh, how much access you have to news um, so I assume or maybe I shouldn't assume that you know about all of the protests um, that have been happening kind of here on the outside world over the past couple of weeks. Are you guys privy to that? I do. Okay. So, um, yes. all right. So with that, I'm going to start with you. Um, so we, we here have been witness to extreme police brutality. Um, we, it's coming to light. Um, I watched a, a montage of sorts of footage the other day and it um it was very hard um it was very hard to watch um and to just see that and so with that as i was watching it i'm realizing that so many of the people committing the brutality the police officers um, are very rarely held accountable for their actions um and so in your where, where you're at do you think that it's true um that people who are responsible for, for criminal justice, um, such as police, prosecutors, judges, and such, that they are held to different rules than, than the public? Yes, uh, it's unfortunate, but they're- You have 60 seconds remaining. A lower standard of behavior than the public. Do is you change the laws. Great, thank you very much. Um, Lyle, here's some questions from the audience. Since it's five o'clock now, we're gonna start taking audience questions and it looks like Jessica's back on too. Um, I'll direct this to Lyle and then Sister Helen if you wanna follow up. How would you recommend getting people getting more involved with death penalty abolition in concrete ways? Okay, so to get involved in, in abolition and anything else related to criminal justice. I, I think it's really important for people to get informed. Uh, it's not enough to uh, take your opinions. In fact, you should never take your opinions from politicians. Uh, you should always uh, research your opinions related to uh, abolition and the criminal justice system. And by research, I mean, you know, read the experts. Uh, check out what people like Brian Stevenson are saying, people like Sister Helen, uh, people who have been really embedded in the efforts to kind of reformat and, and restructure uh, this thing we, we call our criminal justice system. Some other very specific ways that they could get involved in abolition, as everybody knows, they have a they ha have a, a right to vote and they have a duty to vote, and it's not enough to vote in national elections. It's incredibly important to vote in local uh, races, specifically for sheriffs, uh, district attorneys, judges, city council, and it, these races occur virtually every year. And, it, and knowing who the people- You have 60 seconds remaining. Knowing the people that are involved in these races or even what their policies are is critical to really holding them accountable as much as uh, they can be and, and making sure that they're actually working for you. Uh, and those are just, you know, some really basic steps that anybody can take. Get informed and then vote based off of that information. Thank you, Lyle. You know, uh, in my, my memoir that I just wrote, it's called River of Fire and the opening Epigraph is from St. Bonaventure, ask not for understanding, ask for the fire. And my advice to people is start writing and corresponding with death row inmates, the human beings who are suffering under this. Make the personal connection. 
And I'm thinking, if I hadn't written to Pat Sonier, if I hadn't witnessed his death and accompanied him, that led me then, because I caught on fire. I caught on fire through the experience of knowing a real human being. And that's how you find out how the law works. That's how I found out he had crummy lawyers who raised no formal objections during his trial, which meant that no appeal court would take any of the issues of the constitutional violations that had happened. You got to know the law you, and, and the lawyers. I knew nothing. Through him, I began to learn everything. And then what commits us to human rights and then to be involved for the long term? We know a human being. We know somebody who's suffering it, and we learn as we go. And also, what's happening with victims' families? What is the involvement? What have these people promised that they're going to get from these harsh punishments of people or even their deaths? And so we got to care about them, too. we got to care about what's victims' compensation in a state to help people get when they lose their jobs, they lose their focus, their family breaks apart, the counseling. What do they need? get involved directly in some kind of way with real people. And then that relationship as we follow it will teach us everything. I think that's the fire. So I have one here from an audience member that says, how would you recommend getting started to writing a prisoner on death row, like specific organizations or websites that you might recommend? Um, and can you speak to concerns about uh, getting started, like reluctance to share your address or fear of them being executed, those kinds of things. Um, Lyle, do you want to tackle that question? Sure. Uh, writing people on death row is a, a relatively simple process. All you need to do is go to the ncdps.gov website and look up the names of people who are on death row, certainly in North Carolina. I'm sure there are registries in every state that has a death penalty, but you can find the names and the uh, inmate numbers there, uh, and then as well as the address to write. If you're not comfortable doing that directly, there is uh, an organization within uh, Saint, the local church, St. Francis of Assisi. They have a, a pen pal ministry headed by Jill Blaylog. You can contact her, and she can kind of uh, ferry you through the process of getting a pen pal and uh, communicating with somebody on North Carolina's death row. Great. Um, Sister Helen, do you want to talk about specific uh, ways to contact a prisoner and, and maybe address some of the, the concerns about it, although I can also address those? Uh, yeah, why don't you do it, Tessie, because I've spoken already. <laughs> um, so... There's different uh, websites that you can get involved. Honestly, you can just Google it. There's some really, really good ones that will connect you with someone um, who you can write to. As far as concerns about things like sharing your address, uh, worrying about them eventually being executed, those are concerns that I had very deeply when I started. Um, actually, when I started writing to the guys, I opened a PO box so that I wouldn't have to share my address. Uh, but later on, I, when I did develop a trust, I started sharing my, my direct address. Um, so that's something that I think if you, you feel compelled to, to do it that way or you're worried, you can always open a, a P.O. box. Um, another, as far as concerns that someday they might be executed, <laughs> that's something I think about a lot and, and I don't really have an answer except that to me I feel like these are my friends now and and whatever happens to them I want to be there for them so it, it it's not about me or about how I would feel um, witnessing that or about the trauma that it might inflict on my life it's about them and what they need and if what they need is a friend there by their side then that's what I'll be and if they don't want me there then then I won't be um, so I try to just frame it in terms of what is best for them and sort of go from there. You know what, Tessie, let me just say too, when you enter into a relationship with people in prison, uh, there are, people can be very, very, very needy. And especially if it's a woman writing to a man, you need to set your boundaries to be very clear. Uh, be very clear about money, 
be very clear about phone calls, be very clear about relationships. And to make clear coming in that you want to be their friend. And I'll be able to write to you and, and, and make a commitment and stick with it. Now it can grow, but you can say, I'll be able to write to you. I'll make a commitment to you. I will be there for you. Every month, you can expect a letter from me. And I want you to know it's friendship I'm interested in. And then if you get a letter where they're veering away, because, I mean, you just think how hungry these poor guys are, okay? I mean, it's like they're in the desert. I mean, Lyle was very, very honest about how he missed women and just what an important part of your life that is. And it's really hard. So that's just one of the boundary areas you want to be clear about and just to be honest. And you got to build trust. They have to build trust with you. I don't know how many do-gooders maybe parachuted in on them and said, oh, I'm going to be your friend. I'm going to write you letters. What they don't need is broken promises. And here comes this person. Oh, yeah. And then, then they get busy and they don't hear from them again. That is what they don't need. That would be the thing I'd be most solicitous about. Yeah, I agree with that. In Crimson Letters, we actually talk about that in one of the opening chapters that um, one of our co-authors, George, when I was writing to him, at one point made this plea with me that I make like a formal commitment to write regularly or I stop writing because he was so scared that he was going to get attached to the friendship with me and that I would suddenly stop. Okay. Um, so if you don't feel like, like you could commit to writing regularly, even if it's just once a couple months, uh, then I wouldn't write to someone at all because you can actually f inflict real damage by um, promising things and then not keeping those promises. Yes. Yes. That more than anything is probably the number one reason a lot of guys don't even bother to write back to some people that happen to drop a line is that they're afraid of potentially getting attached to somebody and then, you know, they just disappear. I've written uh, a number of people over the years. They've written a few letters, you know, maybe told me a little bit about themselves, uh, asked a few questions and then they just disappear. And there's not, you know, there's no, it's not a Dear John letter that follows. It's just nothing as if the person had never even existed. Uh, and that's hard to bear because it, we have so few connections with the community as it is. But to, you know, essentially be reminded that we're not worthy of that connection, uh, if even only briefly, it's, it's hard. Um, so I have a question for Lyle from the audience. Lyle, in what ways did the experiences you've had in your life cha challenge your religious beliefs? Uh, so it may help to know that uh, I was raised Catholic. Uh, I was baptized, received first communion, but I did not receive uh, confirmation until I got to death row. Uh, and when I received confirmation, even though I said the words and, and went through the, the rite of passage, uh, I wasn't a firm believer. I was kind of still on the edges of belief. I, I still kind of had a real beef with God, uh, so to speak. And it took many years of uh, sincere labor at, at my faith to really come to uh, a position where I, I could have a, a conversation and a relationship with God. Uh, and it's, you know, still spotty sometimes. Uh, I'm not always the greatest communicator, but he's always right there, always uh, reminding me <laughs> that I do need him every day. Um, it's challenging, uh, certainly in the darker moments, in, in the moments where you do stop hearing from somebody, in the moments where you've had a friend taken, in the, in the moments even when uh, people are removed from death row uh, with, with a lesser sentence, because I guess nobody really thinks of it like this, but there isn't much of a difference for those of us who remain on death row and those who are taken uh, by execution or are removed with a life sentence. We lose them either way from our, you know, very tightly knit community. Uh, even though we know in our, our minds and in our hearts that if they receive a life sentence, they're just in another prison. We still never see them again. Uh, mm -hmm. 
very, very much uh, something that you you have to think about. And it's in those times, those uh, difficult times, where you don't hear from uh, family when you when you don't receive visits, or maybe you know somebody or something is going on with your family members that you know you're not necessarily privy to, but you you get the sense that something is going on. That those are the times when my my faith is challenged the most. Uh, when when I when I struggle to you know reach out to God in prayer and and really just say, hey, you know, I'm I'm hurting. Uh, this is hard for me. I don't know how to handle this. Uh, I don't have the strength to handle this. And that's largely uh, what my relationship with God is like. I'm like, hey, you know, I, I need you down here. Uh, can can you help me? Uh, and you know, you you carry on, and then the next thing you know, you're going on about the life that you have and you're existing again and uh, you've gotten through that rough spot. Thank you, Lyle. Um, Sister Helen, a question for you a little bit along the same lines. How do you find spiritual community as someone active in death penalty abolition and related progressive issues? Uh, it's sometimes difficult to find that in a conservative culture. My basic approach that I try to take to everybody is one of compassion. Even standing outside in the dark after Pat was executed that night in April in 84, and I thought about the American people and all the people who said they was for the death penalty. I, the compassionate thing was first just to say, they are good people. These are good people. They just are ignorant and they've been made to be afraid. The political currency was running on, I'm tough on crime and made to be afraid of criminals. They're not human like the rest of us. In fact, the, it was so strong as even to say, you can't trust these people to be put in prison for life. They'll kill other inmates or they'll kill guards. They are scum, they're character. They are, you know, evil. And people were made to be afraid. And when people are made to be afraid, they go along with things. I didn't believe. I mean, and I had myself as an example because I knew nothing. One good thing about being able to write a book and take people with you, all while Tim Robbins was making the movie of Dead Man Walking, he kept saying, the nun was in over her head. And I was in over my head. I knew nothing about anything. And the gift of that when you go to write and take people with you is, look, I'm going to just take you with me and I'll learn something, you'll learn something. And that's the gift of waking up into something and then you write because you want to share it. And sure enough, if you look at the look at the 30 plus years now of discourse, education, books written, People like Lyle, people being able to hear Lyle's voice and what he's saying and being able to go and read his story in Crimson Letters. And people then grow and they change. And we have to say that about people who've committed murder. That's not all they are. As if any human being can be absolutized in one act of their life. We're transcendent in that. We can always grow. It's what redemption's about. And it's what we all are about. And um, so that's the way I approach it. So I'm gonna tell you some interesting things along the road going into audiences across in every, all 50 states. I don't know how many cities I've been to. This was the most interesting thing. The wealthier people were, it's not that they were bad people. You had 60 seconds remaining. Oh, I want Lyle to be able to speak, see? Anyway, it's no just problem. a lot to take them through the experience because they're privileged and they're removed. You got to build the whole fire. You got to get the kindling. You got to tell them the stories. You got to bring them there. The poorer people are, the closer they are to people in society effectiveness, the easier it is for the fire to start. I began to notice that about people. Not that wealthy people were bad, but you just had a lot more work to do because they've been so insulated. You have 30 seconds remaining. Uh, this question is for Sister Helen and myself. It seems we're at a pivotal, pivotal time when the public is questioning the basis of our criminal system and of law enforcement. How do you view this time we seem to be entering in the context of your work? You go first. Okay, I might have to stop if he calls in, but 
Um, so actually this event is a really good example of this. Uh, we had scheduled this event before uh, the events of the past couple of weeks and it was supposed to be just about um, Crimson Letters, uh, but we decided after this happened to, to tie it into current events. So I know that Lyle and I, because we've discussed this at length, see this as a, an opportunity to really elevate those voices and in particular to elevate the voices of people who are most impacted by the criminal justice system. So people like Lyle and um, our other co-authors who, who've been through it. Because uh, I think if you really want to measure your criminal justice system and whether or not it's working, you have to look at the people who are um, actually in it and not the people who run it. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do here is to, to elevate those voices he's calling back so i'm going to give it to you sister helen well and you can see the shift in consciousness see when consciousness changes culture changes and when culture changes then laws and policies change and we are in such a dramatic moment 400 how many years over 400 years the black voice is now black lives matter emerged in 2013 kind of a you know people go okay and some people then some people counted with all lives matter what's a big deal about black people and when people are speaking like that they are speaking out of ignorance they also may be speaking out of their vested interest to keep things the way they are because people benefit from systems in the way they are but this has been such an explosion of consciousness look at this two pandemics one this virus that nobody really knows how we contain it. We know how to flatten the curve on it and all. And it happens and then boom, George Floyd happens. How many George Floyds had been killed ahead of him? But because that little video camera was there in that smartphone, because people could see the brutish cruelty of depriving him of his life and what the eye doesn't see, the heart can't feel, all of America saw that and the world saw that. And I noticed the difference when governors are speaking, they are beginning to connect the death of George Floyd to the legacy of slavery, the huge legacy of racism in this country. This is not an isolated incident. It's happening out of a legacy. So when you had Jesse Jackson's book that the death penalty is legal lynching, when you look at how the death penalty is actually applied, that overwhelmingly it's when white people are killed and people feel outrage over death and you seek an ultimate penalty. Whereas people of color in this country are 50% of all homicides and yet the death penalty is seldom sought. And so then you gotta critique it, you gotta look at what's the power structure, who's benefiting from this. We are in a seismic moment of consciousness right now in the country and it is calling each one of us to become active citizens and engaged in social change in a way we never have before. And if we stand on the sidelines of history and just say, oh, look, it's interesting what's happening, but to get engaged with some kind of community organization to let our voices be heard and to get in there to help create change. And you know what I discovered about hope? The longer I was on the sidelines just saying, oh, that's bad, or I'll pray and ask God to take care of that problem. But boy, the minute I started getting engaged, the minute I put my hand on a rope and did one thing, that's when life flows through you and hope flows through you. Hope is not a wish. It's that comes from being active and letting the life flow through you. Lyle, I love the way, is he back on? Can you hear us? Yes. I love, I yep, love I can hear you. I love the way you talk about and seeing your friends executed and, and who was the special friend that, uh, that taught you? Was it Mule or who was the other one that was executed? Said, live your life, live your life, really live your life, what you have to live it. And you, you got on to that, that you needed to live and to use your gifts to be a participant in life. And when life flows through us, hope flows through us. When we're just watching from the sidelines, it's so despairing and distressing and that it's really, really hard. And the news is really in many, in many fronts right now in our society, it is bad, bad, bad. Um, 
Lyle, I have a, a question for you. Uh, so one of your best okay. quotes, okay. one of your best quotes from Crimson Letters is, over the years, I continue to lean on prayer and try to live my life as it should have been from the beginning. And as I go along discovering all of these wonderful things about life that I can no longer touch, taste, smell, see, and feel, I beg God for mercy. I plead with him to give my time here purpose beyond punishment. Can you tell us, have you found purpose beyond punishment in prison? And what advice would you give to other incarcerated people or unincarcerated about how to find purpose? Uh, the, the short uh, answer the is, short is answer. yes. I, I believe I found. I believe I found purpose, uh, largely in writing, but also in advocating for people who don't have uh, a voice or an ability to speak up. Uh, and it, as far as advice goes, the only advice I can give is to live as. as you, you believe you should live and to really help people. Uh, I know in prison, it, it often feels and it often is that there is nothing. There's nothing to cling to. There's nothing to grasp on. It, you're very much at the bottom of the pit where there, there are no handholds. And it is very uh, difficult to get past that uh, sense of apathy and, and fatalism that, that is very common, not just on death row, but in prison in general. Uh, and it doesn't help that the people who uh, administrate the system, so to speak, uh, don't want you to do well and don't care if you suffer. So a lot of it comes from this idea that I I just don't like being told what to do. Uh, <laughs> and to be told that I, I'm not worthy, uh, that, that I can't do this, that I, I can't survive, that I can't thrive in this place where nobody is meant to, it, it really gets under my skin. It, it really makes me angry uh, because I, I firmly believe that, you know, d despite my, uh, despite my adolescence and, the various ways that I live my life in the free world that this is still my life. This is still my chance to live like I should have lived. And a lot of what drives me uh, is the fact that I, I know it can be done. And I know if it can be done, then, then I need to do it. And that if I can do it, then certainly other people can do it. And if other people can do it from death row, then there's no excuse for anybody else in prison. And if there's no excuse for anybody else in prison, there's definitely not an excuse for anybody in the free world. Uh, and I guess it's this idea that if you have the ability to to live, to, to learn, and, and certainly to love, then you should be doing it. Uh, and that there are no excuses for that to do otherwise. Thank you, Lyle. Great words. <laughs> Um, so let's get a question. I think we should, we can all chip in on this one. Uh, so many people get their ideas about the criminal justice system from TV or from TV shows or movies or maybe the news, but not from direct experience. What are some things you wish the public knew about the criminal justice system uh, and how it operates? And Lyle, you can go first. Um, speaking of accountability, uh, it, it is unfortunate that Hollywood has uh, taken what has been the, a glamorized uh, version of the criminal justice system and, and applied it in such a way that they sell it to the American public as if this is the way things actually work when it is very much not the way things work. Uh, a lot of what you see on TV is so glamorized and, and fictionalized that it totally loses the idea that people who are affected by the criminal justice system are human beings, while it, you know, makes impossible this idea that they could change, that they are uh, worth consideration uh, of, by the public, that they could uh, potentially, or that they have the potential for growth. Uh, and it's 
it's it's really sickening in a lot of ways, especially from prison. I, I can't watch uh, a police show. I, I just can't bring myself to do it because it almost never tells the whole story, and it's always one-sided. Uh, there are very few shows uh, that have a criminal justice uh, bent that, that are, you know, honest looks at what it is to go through this system. And, and that's unfortunate because uh, Hollywood has this really great platform that could be very instructional for the public, and it just isn't. Can I respond to Lyle? Lyle, I just read this. It was really interesting in the New York Times. And this is why I say this is such a seismic thing. If they just said how the network's now pulling off already some of the cop shows that when in the early 90s, crime actually began to go down, crime shows on TV proliferated. And the police were always shown as the hero good guys, even if they had a black person on the police uh, force. They never showed the systemic racism and they never showed policemen being held accountable. Police were always, he always held up as heroes. Or even if sometimes they got caught in situations where maybe they went a bit overboard, they go, well, he's just trying to do his job. And that gives a picture, a false picture, that the policemen are always good, the criminals are always bad. And the same for these prison things that they do. I mean, you just expect these criminals, and of course they're going after drama. See, they're going after blood. Drama is when you got life and death. Drama's when you got a really bad guy. I can see it's beginning to happen. There's going to be a shift in the television culture, and I think in the movie culture too, because we are being faced now, the systemic racism in the police force is so real don't be giving us those cop shows anymore that always show the cops as heroes. You're not telling the truth about society. And so you can see those shifts are happening in the culture and I think it will affect the very thing that you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. I certainly hope so. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I hope that one, um, one thing about Hollywood that they portray a lot that's actually false is the ubiquitous scene of a trial, which is where you have a prosecutor and a defense attorney and a judge and a jury and a case is being heard, both sides listened to equally, and you have your unbiased, unpartial judge and jury who are making a decision about it. But what is actually true about the criminal justice system is that over 90%, that's nine zero percent of all of criminal cases never go to trial at all. So trial is only a, a tiny percentage of what the criminal justice system looks like. And the other 90% are resolved through deals called plea, which happen between the prosecutor and, and the defense attorney. So uh, what it usually looks like is a prosecutor can take someone, um, again, often a minority, often a, a person who's poor, who's scared, who's just been arrested, and they'll say, hey, we can get you on six different charges and you'll get 20 years if you go to prison. Uh, and if, we, if you go to trial and we convict you, we'll put you away for 20 years. Or we can make all but one of those charges completely disappear. And the prosecutors have the authority to do that, to make any and all charges disappear. And we'll give you, we'll only charge you on one thing and you'll just get one year and we might even let you off on probation if you will just sign this document that waives your right to a trial and a judge and a jury. And that is what happens in 90% of cases in the criminal justice system. The defendant waives their right to a jury often because they're scared and they're used and they're threatened with a sentence that is 10 or more times what, uh, what they're agreeing to they sign the document or they're promised other things. Like if you sign this, you waive your right to a trial, we'll let you out today. And you can go home and go back to your family. And they're not told that when they sign that paper, they're gonna have a criminal record against them for the rest of their lives. They're gonna be denied employment, housing, scholarships, uh, and a number of other things, the right to vote in a lot of states. Um, so that's something about the reality of, of the criminal justice system that a lot of people don't know about. Um, Lyle, let's, we only have you for a few more minutes, so let's get some uh, questions for you. 
If you could give the people listening on this call one action item to do when they get off the call, what would it be? You have 60 seconds remaining. Um, I may be able to call back. Oh, great. Great. Fine with me. Hold up. <laughs> they only have one phone in the yeah. prison. So he has to oh, negotiate with other people to use it. And they're allowing him to use it for this hour. It's very generous of the other people uh, who are on the block with him. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Those prisoners have no rights. I mean, to communication, to speak to the press, you just look, they are just so curtailed in every one of their civil rights as citizens. It's just so incredible, the communications thing. Yeah. I think he, yeah, I think he got um, kicked off. So, Lyle, are you still there? I don't think so. Oh, here he's kind of call back. All right, Sister Helen, can you answer that question, please? One action item. One action. No, I just want to stress the personal involvement in some way with people who are privileged, have never stepped inside of a jail or a prison system, to cross over the, and see these, like the way Pope Francis puts it, oh, he's back. If he's back, as long as we have him, we want his voice as much as possible. He's not it's, back. I'm he's not working back on it. Especially for those of us who have been given so much. That energy we have as middle class people, those of us not worried about health care. Well, a lot of us are now worried about a lot of things because COVID has really upturned all of us. So we can feel the solidarity with people who have always been struggling. But to reach out in some way, you know, when Lyle said that, he reaches out to people to help them in love, that's what really redeems us as human beings. Whatever we're going through when we reach out, we're made for relationships. We're made to get past this ego thing and the self-serving thing to be able to love others. It's our real purpose. And so in any way we do that. And there's so many needs now. It's not only people in prison. I mean, we have food shortages. People are hungry to work at food banks. People need food. We have so many needs now in our society. And to do something, to pick up the rope somewhere. Is it with children? Is it with people in the nursing homes? Where is it? But get in there somewhere. Lyle, are you back? It that might is. not have worked. I was having some trouble going back in. I don't think he's on. Okay. Um, and just think for a moment how incredibly generous it is you, how many when do you how many calls do you get for the other prisoners to let him have this uh yeah. because it's an act of love on their part wherever you are guys thank you so i want to jump in uh, and have a question that i know you guys talked while i was away um you had started to kind of talk about how to contact uh, the inmates whether it's writing um but this may be more for Tessie when able, she's able to talk with us uh, specifically about North Carolina, but Sister Helen, um, for those who are actually have, um, say, skill sets that want to volunteer directly in the prisons, um, what does that typically involve and how many hoops would someone have to jump through uh, to actually be able to enter into the prisons to have face-to-face -face, um, interaction through programming and such as that? Just want to say it's difficult, and hoops is the right word. Prisons generally don't want outsiders coming in. They run like an institution. They want everything. Anytime you set up an education program, it means extra guards or correctional officers. They don't like trouble. They don't like outsiders coming in. So just imagine going in, you're going to face challenges. You got to be associated in some kind of way with a group of people already doing it. So you got to do a little research. Is it a church group going in? Is it people out of the ACLU? Is it people, citizens who care about prisoners and prison reform? You got to go into your community, see who's doing what and get in there. And you can't just expect you'll make one phone call or write one letter and they're going to say, welcome to our prison. We want you to come and teach a poetry class. It's not going to happen and you got to fight for it. <laughs> Is he back? There we go. I think Lyle's back. Are you with us? Yeah. Oh, Sorry. okay. <laughs> I was laughing at the poetry comment. 
right? <laughs> are, are people lining up to teach poetry in that prison? Oh, yes, yes. Well, just from the inside, why is it often you get this institutional resistance to outsiders coming in, uh, volunteers coming in to teach a class for uh, spiritual retreats? What's the resistance? that's in the institution that you've experienced? The resistance comes from training, uh, and that training is deeply rooted in this idea that people in prison are less than, uh, that they are the enemy, uh, that they are not worth the time or resources it takes to educate, rehabilitate, and help. Um, and a lot of it also has to do with politics, and that's unfortunate because politics change a lot. And over the 23 years I've been in prison, I've seen uh, it go from incredibly punitive to incredibly rehabilitative back to punitive, and it appears uh, for all intents and purposes as if it's going to uh, shift back into uh, kind of a, a rehabilitative mindset and you know for those of us who have done a lot of time in prison who have been here you know most of our lives it, it's it's like okay well I wonder how this is going how long this is going to last because if the rehabilitative mindset changes again then the people who are now for uh, more punitive I ideology are put back into those positions of like the director of prisons and the warden and uh, other prison officials so they can, you know, implement their own policies. And a lot of that has to do, like I said, with, with politics. And if the politics were removed from that equation and the model was set in kind of in stone so that prisons were like they were originally intended to be, and that's rehabilitative, uh, then you would see a lot of the problems uh, disappear from prison in a relatively short period of time. Violence would go down, fewer people re would recidivate, and more people would learn because that really is the whole point of prison, right? Not just to make the public safe, but to teach those who have committed crimes a, a lesson. Uh, but that lesson isn't being taught. What's, what's happening is people are being incarcerated they're being put in this box and uh, for relatively longer periods of time. And for those that get out, they've not learned anything. They've uh, devolved, in fact. And then when they return to the communities, they have nothing to show for it and nothing but bitterness uh, to go along with it. So a lot of the problem with that is the mindset of the people who run these prisons, who continue to make penal policy throughout the state and throughout this country. There is this idea that once a person enters the criminal justice system, they are less than. And so long as that continues, so long as that there is a disconnect that exists between those people and the general public, there will always be that problem. Uh, Lyle? Uh, there, there are some shifts happening, like you hear it in, instead of tough on crime, now we're beginning to hear smart on crime. There are shifts in consciousness happening about penal reform. Can you speak to that at all? Or do you see that at all? Yes. Uh, so the smart on crime movement, I, I certainly hope it lasts. Uh, if it was really going to be smart on crime, it remove the politicians from that equation, but I know that's you know kind of impossible, uh, at least for right now. Uh, we can certainly move in that direction. Uh, it's important to remember that being smart on crime means uh, addressing it at every level, not just in the street uh, with law enforcement, but in the courtrooms with judges and prosecutors. It means addressing it in the prisons, uh, where reentry begins the moment you enter the prison, not the day you leave. Uh, and it, it's important to address it at the highest levels of those government officials who are dictating the policies that govern our prisons and govern law enforcement and, uh, well, I should say, govern 
district attorneys, but nobody governs them, it seems. Uh, but yeah, no. smart on crime is is a, is about uh, really changing the way that we deal in criminal justice and uh, not returning to old models, but creating new ones. Right. The, the beginnings I see are like the alternative drug courts now, instead of young people being sent to prison for a long time for drugs, you have an, a drug court and to help them deal with the problem. In Louisiana, uh, we have a real decent governor, uh, John Bell Edwards, and he looked at, we have, in Louisiana, we incarcerate people for longer sentences than any other prison. Our country incarcerates Our country, our country. Anyway, anyway. The, the governor, I'm getting a lot of feedback, but the governor just looked at all the geriatric wards we have of people who got life without parole, nothing. And just said, to what purpose are we keeping people in their 70s and 80s in prison? And, uh, and so began to, to let them out. Um, and then people sick, there's a huge crisis with the COVID-19 thing that people are smashed together in the prison and they're getting infected. And we have 420,000 correctional officers and staff that go in and out of prisons every day, bringing it home to their families. So when the community can see there's, there's interconnected Yes, there's not these people over in exile and throw them away, throw away the key, it doesn't affect us. We are interconnected. This is, you hesitate to call it a gift of the pandemic, but what's going on in prisons affects the community as well. You see anything there, Lyle, you want to comment on? Uh, yeah, so I've, I've heard a little bit and read a little bit about the drug courts, and those are certainly uh, a great step forward. Uh, but. It's one of those things that you see kind of uh, fixing the fringes, so to speak. Yeah. If there is going to be uh, this idea of being smart on crime, of, of really addressing uh, criminal justice reform and, you know, ending mass incarceration, then it needs to be inclusive and uh, overwhelmingly systematic, uh, for lack of a better description. Um, and that means addressing the longer sentences, like life without parole. Uh, and we, you know, this is one of those things where we have to stop pretending that life without parole is mercy, and it's not. Uh, too many times people are being scared with a death sentence, and this goes back to what Tessie was saying about uh, plea bargaining. Uh, prosecutors will often uh, use the death penalty to scare uh, defendants into pleading guilty and essentially throwing away their lives. Uh, and their their rights uh, for a life sentence that there is no end to, um, and th and that's one of the major uh, changes that that need to occur, uh, and that is uh, addressing throwing away people in prison. Uh, that's mm -hmm. kind of what the parole system was originally intended to do: is create this mechanism for a, a second look or you know, a, a back-end uh, review of any sentence. But in North Carolina, for example, when the parole system was abolished and, and that was ended, uh, that hurt a lot of people, thousands of people, in fact. There are thousands of people in North Carolina prisons who will, in fact, never get out because of that. And in addition to the, the life without parole sentences and the, the end of the abolition of parole, uh, there is this idea that longer sentences work, that they improve public safety when the idea never came from an expert. The, the idea came from uh, rhetoric of being tough on crime. It was not rooted in this idea that people improve under longer sentences, they in fact oftentimes deteriorate and are less capable of reentering society. So if we're to be smart on crime, if, if we're to really uh, change the way we think about incarceration, then there really needs to be uh, deep and a lasting change in the way that we sentence people to prison. Uh, and there, there must be an opportunity to uh, 
look at people who have changed over time. So we're a little bit short on time. So Lyle, I have one more question for you. And this is the one I believe that um, Tessie was about to ask uh, when you had to sign off before. So, you know, kind of parting thoughts for folks, if there was one action item that you wanted from folks after um, listening today, what would that be? So for those of you who are in North Carolina and listening, I want you to contact the Governor Cooper's newest uh, task force, I believe it's called the uh, North Carolina Task Force on Racial Equ Equity and Criminal Justice. It's being led by Attorney General Josh Stein and the State Supreme Court Justice Anita Earls. And they're currently soliciting feedback uh, from the public and are attempting to uh, make true reforms throughout the system. Uh, and it is important to let them know what you know and let them know what you want out of these reforms. Uh, for those of you who are maybe less interested in, in doing something that direct, uh, I would suggest that you talk to the people that you know who are silent, who are sitting on the sidelines thinking that this doesn't impact them. Uh, there are no sidelines in this particular fight. Uh, you are either attempting to change the system and uh, address discrimination as it affects everybody or you're you're not helping you <laughs> if you're not helping you're part of that problem uh, mm -hmm. there can be no more silence uh, there can be no more neutral parties you have 60 seconds remaining it's, it's really time for you to step up and uh, address those people who would say well this doesn't affect me it does it very much does it affects everybody thank you there are no sidelines Thank you. So Lyle, I know you're about to jump off. So everyone, you have been unmuted. If you would like to give snaps or soft claps and thank Lyle for his, uh, for coming in and joining us 30 today. Seconds remaining. Um, so go ahead, everybody, you're unmuted. So make the noise. Yay! Lyle. So thank you so much, Lyle. Lyle. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody. So uh, I know Lyle is gonna get kicked off here in just a, a second. So we're just gonna wrap up with um, Sister Helen and Tessie. Um, Lyle, if you're still there, thank you so much. Thank you. Lyle. I think he's gone. Yeah, all right. So uh, Sister Helen, Tessie, hold on two seconds. I'm gonna mute everybody again and then unmute just you. <laughs> Bye y'all. Okay. Sister Helen and Tessie, yes. All right, so we're all back. Um, so yeah, we only have a couple minutes, so I just wanted to um, thank you both, and I apologize for my technical difficulties. My computer just freaked out and shut down. Um, yeah. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Um, we did have some more questions, but we don't really have a whole lot of time to delve into those. Um, but what I did want to ask was, um, Someone had asked specifically if there's a way to continue this conversation with you two in particular. Um, I know that you're both on social media, um, and so that's a great place to start. Um, Sister Helen is, I think on all three platforms is Helen Prejean. Um, Tessie is Tessie the Writer on Instagram, and the same on Twitter, I believe. Um, but as far as any other um, direct uh, contact with you two, um, is that possible? And if so, if you'll let folks know. Well, the way to communicate with me is through my social media and you go to sisterhelen.com. It's got everything on it. And that's how we continue the conversation. I want it, whatever remaining time, I want Tessie to be able, because my voice is heard a lot, to be able to hear from Tessie. But we're going to really advocate getting this book out there. The more we can get this book out there for people to read, the quicker the consciousness changes and the society changes. So go, Tessie. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. You're very generous. Um, so yes, there is a way to continue the conversation with Lyle and myself and our other three co-authors who are equally as incredible as Lyle is. And I really mean that when you talk to all three of them. Um, we are engaging in an ongoing book club with Crimson Letters. So uh, we have four meetings that we do and um, the book is divided into four sections. So each 
of the co-authors gets his own section uh, where he writes about his, his journey. Um, and so the book club meets four times and, it, and it's a Zoom meeting and on each meeting that co-author calls in. So in the book club, you would have a chance to have a full conversation again with Lyle, with George, with Terry and with Michael, all of our co-authors. And that's a way to continue to engage and to hear those voices. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. The book club is free. Uh, you would just have to have the book and that can be purchased on from any bookstore if you want to support your local bookstore I really um, emphasize that particularly if you can support a minority owned local bookstore I think at this time it's really important that we that we show our support for um, black and brown folks who own businesses and try to make our purchases from them as much as possible uh, it's also available on uh, audible if you like to listen to, to books and on Amazon. Um, another thing that we're trying to do to raise consciousness, I'm also starting a book club around uh, the book White Fragility, because I think that with everything going on in the world right now, it's really important that, that those of us who have the privilege of, of being white understand uh, what that privilege is and how we may be contributing to the problems uh, even without realizing it. Uh, either by silence or by different ways in which we um, often resist being told that what we're doing is, is problematic. Uh, so we're going to be having those conversations starting in July, uh, where we're going to be going over those uh, that really important book. And to get involved in that, you can just email me, and I'm having um, Jessica send out the email and just say, be involved in the White Fragility Book Club. To sign up for the Crimson Letters Book Club, you can do that on my website, tessiecastillo.com, and there's a tab that just says Book Club at the bottom. And we would really love, I mean, those conversations with all four of the guys get so deep. It's just really incredible uh, and impactful to talk with them. In fact, I know that some people who've already done the book club are on this call. Um, so that is uh, how I would encourage people to continue to stay in contact with us. If you think you can commit to writing someone in prison, please do. Um, and if you want to get involved in the really important racial justice work, I, I would first, if you're a person, if you're a white person, first look at yourself and sort of resolve those issues and, and understand your own biases and your own place in this conversation, and then reach out to organizations and try to get involved on, um, on that level. Because I think that the change is going to have to take place within us first. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Sister, Helen, right. thank you. Sister Helen, is there anything, any events um, that you have coming up that you want to let folks know about? I guess it's uh, hard to travel these days if you're doing anything else online that we can right. tap into. <laughs> well, I got the focus of my summer. I'm writing another book. Summers are usually for that. I do for very special things like this. Uh, do some Zoom events. So I'm kind of dormant in the summer with this because we're gearing up for the fall with the huge transition. I found how dynamic it can be to do classes where the class reads a book and then the author can come in at the beginning to introduce the book. We're doing this with my books, of course, Dead Man Walking, but River Fire, um, and Death of Innocence about the story of two innocent people. Then the class, because and the reading of books is really important in our society. You know, our young people's brains are getting frazzled and fragmented from just getting information, tidbits when you Google something up. Mm -hmm. To read a book brings you into a coherent space where you can do a deeper meditation. It's good coherence. So anyway, the students read the book and then uh, the author comes in at the end of it. So this is in university classes. All my traveling into universities and speaking got changed by on March 12th. So we're gearing that up, building the models for the fall. But I just want to say a word about Tessie and how things like this happen. One person has an experience, they're changed by it. They care enough about the people they encounter and the society to initiate something like this. And that's the way the world changes. So it's been a privilege to be part of this with you and uh, and just even to be in the presence of Lyle and hear his voice. But all of you out there, 
that we don't get to meet personally, but it's just really important. And thank you, Greensboro Bound, Jessica and company for making this happen. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much to both of you. I know that this has already been a changing experience for me. Tessie, I want to talk to you some more later about some things, some ideas that I have, um, the way that I can be of service. Um, but to everyone, thank you for tuning in, especially Sister Helen. It's really an honor to meet you. Um, everybody, please uh, buy the book, Crimson Letters, here. If you're in Greensboro, check out Scuppernong Books. Here's River of Fire. Uh, good stuff. Um, also, just to remind you guys that this is part one of our four-part series. So Tessie and I will be speaking with the remainder of her co-host um, next Tuesday, the 16th. Uh, we'll be speaking with Dr. Frank Baumgartner, who Tessie has worked with uh, and knows well. And uh, I believe it's Terry Robinson uh, will be talking. He is the co-author who will be calling in. Then the following Thursday, the 25th of June, uh, we will have, uh, let's see, Dr. Robert A. Brown. Uh, that's going to be an intense conversation with him, no doubt, um, with that topic. And he will be speaking with um, Michael, Michael Braxton. And then our final event will be on Tuesday, June 30th. And then we'll have John Powell, who runs the um, Restorative Justice Center at Campbell. And George Wilkerson will be speaking with him. So I know I just threw a lot of names and dates at you. Um, but basically it's staggering. Today is Thursday. The next event will be Tuesday, then the following Thursday, then the following Tuesday through the end of the month. Um, you can find that all on greensboroboundcom forward slash events. You can see all of the information. We also will have the topics that we'll be discussing with these, each of our special guests. Um, and it will be similar to how we did today, uh, hopefully with no technical difficulties. So uh, again, I know that's a lot of information, greensboroboundcom forward slash events. You can find everything there. I'll also be posting links to Tessie's website, Sister Helen's website. Um, thank you again, ladies. I really, really appreciate your time and the work that you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, you guys, be safe and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.